this time, and if you'll open your Bibles back to the book of John, chapter number 5, where we've been now for, uh, well, just two weeks ago, and we'll continue in John 5 today. I'm going to be honest with everybody in the room. We got finished with John 3, and we hit John 4, went through the Samaritan woman, went through the... Uh, the, the healing of the royal official, Gary, and then we came to John 5, and I thought, man, John 5, we'll breeze right through, and we'll hit John 6, and I'll be in Jesus feeding the 5,000, and it'll be good, and I can't wait to get to John 6, and then I hit John 5, and oh man, it just kind of bogged me down, I promise you. Uh, if you want to read some very, very deep, heartfelt passages spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ, just open your Bible in John 5 this afternoon and just read what he has to say to the Pharisees in John 5. I thought Rick, I thought Danny, we would breeze home through John 5, but after reading it over and over again for the last few weeks, I believe we'll just be here for a while. So we're just going to camp right here while we can. John 5, today I want to bring a message to you entitled this, The Danger, The Dangers of Man-Made Religion. The dangers of man-made religion. Now let's read together, starting in verse number 9. I'm just going to read the first couple words, and then I'm going to pause, give you a little background, and then we're going to read the rest down through verse 18. The Bible says this in verse number 9. Now that day was a Sabbath day. That day was a Sabbath day. Now, I grew up, Brother Mac, in a good what you would call Bible-believing Christian home. And my parents believed in a day of rest. Now, the Jews, of course, celebrated the Sabbath day on Saturday, the seventh day of the week. But my parents, being the good Southern Baptist Christians that they are, celebrated the Sabbath day on Sunday afternoon. Now, if you're with me on this, you'll, or if you grew up in a time like this, you'll understand what I'm saying but for us, growing up, Danny, Sunday was the day of rest. Uh, we'd get up and we'd go to church. And we'd come home in the afternoon and we might watch a football game. We might sit around and do nothing. We might just eat a big lunch that my mama had prepared or whatever. And then Sunday night we'd go back to church. But there were some things that were not allowed on Sunday. I couldn't fish on Sunday. Now that's relaxing to some folks and I guess that'd be rest, but... It was taught in my house, fishing was off limits on Sunday. My daddy always told us this, if you fish on Sunday, you won't catch anything, and you'll be absolutely miserable. And so one day I talked him into letting me go fishing on Sunday, and guess what? I didn't catch anything, and I was absolutely miserable. He was right. But that's kind of my fishing life anyway. I don't ever catch anything. But not only that, we, we weren't allowed uh, to to do any type of work on Sunday, like cutting the grass. My daddy said, if you cut grass on Sunday, your grass will die. You won't have a good-looking yard. It'll die if you do it on Sunday. Sunday was devoted as a day of rest in our home. Now, when we look at Judaism, when we look at the religion that Jesus was in the midst of and teaching in, their Sabbath day was, of course, Saturday. But the Sabbath day was actually first observed by none other than God himself. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. By the seventh day, God had completed his work that he had done, and he rested. The actual word there in the Hebrew is the word Shabbat, which means to rest is where we get the word, English word, Sabbath. He rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and he declared it holy. For on it he rested from his work of creation. Now, to kind of get the picture here of what happened with God and what God was doing, I want you to rewind back about four weeks ago on a Saturday. I woke up that morning with what we would like to call a honey-do list. Men, have you ever experienced a honeydew list? Anybody? Am I the only one? Danny. Thank, thank you, Danny, for being honest. I appreciate you. Uh, a honeydew list. I had things that Summer wanted me to do that day. 
I had to cut the grass, number one. I had to water the tomatoes, number two. I had to water the watermelons, number three. Then I had to wash the cars, both mine and hers. After that, I had to vacuum and clean them out. Then after that, I had to do a few other things, wash the dishes and such. And so I got up that Saturday morning. I did all these things. I got finished that afternoon about 2 o'clock. And I stepped back, Greg. And I looked at everything that I had done that day. And I said, I am finished. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to rest. And so I did what I always do. I laid down on my couch. And I took a good nap. That's a good rest. It's the same idea that we find in the Bible in Genesis chapter number 2. God took six days to create the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, he stepped back. And he looked at all he had created. He saw it in its beauty, in its perfection. He saw it in, in its unfallen estate. And he was content. He was pleased. There was no work left to be done. And so he rested. Now, he didn't sleep like I slept. He didn't take a nap. No, God did not lose energy or get tired when he created everything. He simply was content. He stepped back and he looked at all of his creation and he said, It is finished and I will rest from the work of my hands. And God rested. What a beautiful picture. And a beautiful thought for all of us today that God not only rested on the seventh day, but the Bible says he declared it holy. Amen. He set it apart as a day for us to worship him, to remember all that he had done, to remember him as creator, to remember his work. The Sabbath day was declared holy so that we might praise him on that day, setting aside all of our work, all of our effort, solely to give glory and honor to him. David wrote Psalm 92, and it was a psalm that he wrote intended to be read on the Sabbath day. He said these words in verse 1 through 3, it is good to praise Yahweh. This would have been read on the Sabbath day in the synagogue, the beginning of a service that would have stood up and they would have said, it is good to praise Yahweh. It is good to sing praises to his name. Most high, to declare your faithful love in the morning and your faithfulness at night with a ten-stringed harp and the music of a lyre. God's Sabbath rest was a beautiful thing, and it is a beautiful thing. We have this picture of God's contentment, satisfaction, with all of his creation, all things working in order the way that he created them. But as with all things destroyed by the fall, God's Sabbath rest was interrupted by the sin of man. For on that day, now there's work to be done. Now God has to put forth his plan of salvation that had been conceived before the foundation of the world to send forth his son to the cross of Calvary so that man would learn not to rest in a day, rather to rest in a person. The book of Colossians chapter number 2 says this, Therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink or in the matter of a festival or new moon or the Sabbath day. These are the things that are to, uh, or these are the shadow of what was to come. The substance, the Bible says, is the Messiah. Now listen, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11, God gives the Israelites this fourth command. You'll know it. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. You are to labor for six days and do all your work, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath day is to be a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You are not to do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male, your female slave, your livestock, or the foreigner who resides within your gates. For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in them in six days, and then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and declared it holy. This command that 
God gave the Israelites was to be a precursor, a foreshadowing, if you will, of the rest that we could ultimately find in Christ. Now, we're going to catch that at the very end of this message. But know this. As with all things, God gave a command. Rest on the Savior. Set it aside. Declare it holy. He gave them this day of rest, something beautiful, something meant for their benefit, something meant for our blessing. But the Jews, the rabbis, the priests, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, the scribes, as they always did, they put their own twists, they put their own thoughts. Onto what they thought the Sabbath day should be. And so by the time we reach this story in the life of Jesus, the Sabbath day was no longer a day of rest, but it was a day filled with rules and regulations that bogged down, burdened, and barred the Jews from doing any meaningful task on this certain day of the week. So with that as our background, let's, be, let's continue reading. Here in chapter number 5, that day was the Sabbath. We heard what the Sabbath was. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, remember, we've just seen a man who's been laying by a pool for 38 years, lame and unable to get into the pool by himself, waiting for the angels to stir the water. We've just seen Jesus come to this man and say, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And the Bible says what? Immediately he picks up his mat and he begins to walk. This man has just been healed. And the Bible says it's a Sabbath day. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, praise God from whom all blessings flow. No, that's not what they said. They said this is the Sabbath. It's illegal for you to pick up your mat on this day. Think of the travesty of that moment. The man replied, the man who made me well, he told me, pick up your mat and walk. Who is this man who told you to pick up your mat and walk, they asked. But the man who was cured, he did not know who it was because Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. And after this, Jesus found him in the temple complex and said to him, see, you are well. Do not sin anymore so that something worse doesn't happen to you. The man went and he reported to the Jews, that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore, verse 16, listen to the heartbreak of this verse. Therefore, the Jews began persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus responded, my father is still working, and I am working also. And this is why the Jews began trying all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. The dangers of man-made religion. Number one, the first danger is this. Man-made religion becomes a burden. Man-made religion becomes a burden. Not only does it become a burden, BJ, but it becomes a dreadful burden. The extremes that these Jews went through to, uh, these rabbis, these priests went to to make sure the Sabbath was set aside as a day of rest bordered on insanity. Listen, if I was a Jew in that day and somehow on the Sabbath day I'd fallen down and cut my arm so bad that it needed stitches, so bad I had to have somebody to bandage it up, it was illegal on the Sabbath day to cover the wound, to bandage it. I had to leave it open until the next appointed day. It was illegal on the Sabbath day if I had a pot that cracked and it was storing, say, my milk or my fresh water supply. That pot cracked and water, the liquid, was beginning to shoot out. It was illegal for me to close the hole in the pot so that I could save my liquid. It was illegal for a man to move just one sheaf in his field, but he could lay a spoon on that sheaf and then remove the sheaf in order to get the spoon back in his hand. This is the types of burdens, the types of laws that the Jews were placing on the Sabbath day. 
This was a day that God had declared holy, but these men and their laws and their traditions, the way they had twisted things, had now made this day a burden. So with that as our background, no wonder we hear in John chapter 5, 8 through 10, Jesus say, get up, pick up your mat and walk, and then we hear what? The Jewish priests and the Jewish rabbis say, this is a Sabbath day. It's illegal for you to pick up your mat. Think of the travesty and the incident that we just witnessed. Here's a man who's been by that pool, Justin, for 38 years. 38 years in misery. 38 years not able to get up, not able to walk, not able to run, not able to jump, not able to shout, not able to dance. None of those things that after 38 years, a man has come along and told him, pick up your mat and walk, and instantly his muscles are restored, and he gets up and he begins to strut around, and he picks up his mat, shouting, singing, dancing, all for the first time in 38 years. Listen, he laid by that pool long enough. He didn't want to lay there anymore. He wanted to go home. He wanted to get to that temple, get to the priest, have them declare him clean, and he was out of there. He didn't want to live in his misery. His misery was over. So he picks up his mat, and he's walking with a smile on his face. Everyone's looking. Everyone's clapping. Everyone's worshiping. Everyone's wondering, can this happened to me. How was he healed? And is it possible that I can be healed too? He didn't even get in the water. And all this has taken place. And in the midst of all of that, within a few moments of being able to walk for the first time in 38 years, a few moments of picking up his mat, the same Jewish religious officials who for 38 years turned their heads toward him every time they passed on the way to the temple. These same Jewish religious officials who never went over and knelt beside him in prayer. The same ones who never went and offered him a cold drink of water. The same ones who never came along and just said, I want you to know I'm praying for you today. These same Jewish officials who had nothing to do with this man now walk by and are all too quick to run over and say something to him. Now, who gave you the right to pick up your man? This is the Sabbath. What you're doing is illegal. Put that mat down. Don't you know you've broken the law by doing so? And I can just imagine Lonnie as Jesus watched from the distance. How his heart must have broken to watch this scene play out before him. This man, this newly healed man, he understood Something that these Jewish religious officials should understand, but they didn't. This man who had laid by that pool for 38 years and had just been healed was experiencing the peace that passes understanding when Jesus moves in. This man who was in misery for 38 years now in his heart was content. He was at peace. He was at rest because of Jesus but this religious party and their wrongly motivated zeal were trying to put him back under the law when he had been set free in Christ. Amen. I wonder if this moment, if Jesus just wanted to step in and say, you teach as the commandments of God the doctrines of men. I wonder if Jesus wanted to step in and say, guys, listen to me. The Sabbath was made for the man, not man for the Sabbath. Oh, how his heart must have sank. And oh, how he longed for those religious men to just understand their folly and their burden, or, or, or their, their folly and the burden that they were placing on the necks of the Jewish community. He hoped 
that this would be a moment that they would see joy in the life of a man and maybe they would experience his joy too. But instead of seeing joy, peace, and freedom on his face, on their face, they demand to know who told you to pick up your man and walk. I wonder if this at this moment, Brother Gary, if they already had an inkling in their heart of who had healed that man. I wonder if down deep in their heart they were just hoping, praying that maybe this man would say, Jesus told me to do so. And give him a little fuel for their fire, a reason to condemn him, a reason to stone him in the streets. If he would just say, Jesus, I wonder if at this moment these religious officials were foaming at the mouth, just waiting to hear the name they knew this man would say. Do you feel the heartbreak of the scene before you as we see man-made religion's burden placed on the necks of people who are set free from the bondage of sin? You say to me, well, Zach, that's not us. We don't even observe the Sabbath day. We don't place man-made traditions and religions on the backs of people. We don't expect more of them than what the Bible says. This doesn't pertain to us, but friends, I'm here to tell you it does pertain to us because we in our denominations, in our religions, in our teachings, we unjustifiably use our own traditions and religions to put people back in bondage instead of allowing them to feel the blessing of simply knowing Christ. Listen, in the Pentecostal church, it's the belief that if you can't speak in tongues, you're not saved. Imagine the burden that places on people's hearts. They've walked into a Pentecostal church. They've experienced God move in their life. They give him their heart. They think they're saved. But then some preacher comes along and says, have you talked in tongues? Have you been baptized with fire? Well, no, I haven't, sir. Well, until you are, you're not secure in your salvation. Imagine the heart. Imagine the feeling of unassurance that somebody must feel. And the church of God is that belief that women have to wear ankle-length skirts and cover their arms everywhere they go. In the Romanian church, is the belief that women must wear head coverings to be viewed as holy. In the Presbyterian church, is that burden of infant baptism. That's not in the Scripture. And yet they teach it. As a commandment of God. In the Catholic Church, it's the belief that you can't pray straight to God. Instead, you have to go to a priest and say a bunch of Hail Marys. For the Lutherans, it's a red painted door. For the free will Baptists, it's the belief that if it's not the King James Version, it's a perverse. In the Baptist Church, where do we even begin? With the burden that we place on the necks of people. In the Southern Baptist Church, if you're divorced, you're disqualified. In the Southern Baptist Church, if you don't pay 10%, you're considered a less than Christian. In the Southern Baptist Church, if you attend only one service a week, you're considered backslidden. If you don't wear tie in the pulpit, you're liberal. If you raise your hands in worship, you're Baptocostal and you're shocked. If you get a tattoo, you has better have it covered before you walk in the door of the church. If you're black, go to a black church. If you're white, go to a white church. The pastor better visit it at least once a month. If not, he's not a very good pastor. The altar's a no-go zone because everybody's going to know you have something going on in your life and people are going to gossip. If you have a child outside of wedlock, you're pushed aside. I'm sure that the heart 
of Jesus breaks today as he sees the unnecessary burdens that we place on people each day of the week as we build our own religions instead of lead people into a relationship with him. My heart still breaks. Many of you have heard me tell this. My heart still breaks thinking about a day about four years ago just after I had become pastor here. Many of you have heard me tell this. Some of you have I've been pastor here maybe six weeks. And like I said earlier, I grew up with a good mom and daddy who took me to church. One thing I was taught from the smallest age was when you go to church, if you have on a ball cap, you take it off before you walk in the door. To this day, Miss Kate, if I come to this church by myself in the middle of the week and for some reason I have a hat on, I'm going to take it off when I walk in the door. I may be here by myself. It's just what I've been trained to do all my life. Six weeks after I became pastor here, six, seven weeks, I walked in the door, I came here to the front row, and I noticed a guy about three or four pews back, and he had a hat on his head, kind of like Lonnie this morning, had a hat on his head. I've been pastor here about seven weeks, and I thought to myself, everybody's watching me right now to see what I'm going to do about that guy with that hat on his head. Am I going to say something to him, or am I going to let this thing slide? And I thought back about my mom and my daddy, how they taught me about the hat. And I said, I know what I'm going to do. i got to say something. i got to tell him we don't wear hats in this building. So I walked back to that man, and I got right there in his pew, and I looked at him, and I said, Sir, I'm not trying to be mean, but I want you to know that hats aren't allowed in this building. You can take your hat off. By looking at this man's face, you could tell that he was living a pretty rough life. Just by looking at him, you could tell that Either he had lived really rough and gotten saved, just wanted to see what was going on, or he was living rough right then, and he was a rough-looking guy. He took his hat off, went through the whole service. And you know, it's been four years ago, and he's never been back. But about three days after that happened, God spoke to my heart, and this is what he said to me. Is that man wearing a hat inside of your building the second Baptist, more important than the salvation. And I have to live knowing that that man might die and spend eternity in hell, all because I placed a burden on his neck and said, your hat's not allowed in this building. Is his hat worth his soul? In my heart that day, I made a determination that yes, it was, but today I stand to tell you it's not worth it. Man-made religion, man-made tradition, man-made customs, man-made rules, man-made ordinances become a burden. Secondly, though, man-made religion, it blocks. Man-made religion blocks the work of God in our midst. Man-made religion blocks the work of God in our midst. Let me tell you about when I was going to fruit. I was a young preacher boy. I didn't know much back then, Brother Max. Still don't know much now. But back then, I especially didn't know much. And I didn't know that as an unordained preacher that I wasn't allowed at Fruitland Baptist Bible Institute to give the Lord's Supper to people in a service. So every Thursday night, Brother Head, we had service down at the chapel. And I told a few of my friends, Michael Turner was one of them, he's here with us now. I told Michael, Kent Leonard, he used to be here with us. I told a young lady, I said, I'm going to do, I'm going to give the Lord's Supper tonight in chapel service. So I went and got all the grape juice, I got all the bread, and I came down that day, and I set it all up so that when everybody come in, I could, we could have the Lord's Supper together. And boy, we had, I don't know, 20, 30 people show up to that chapel service, and Amanda, we gave the Lord's Supper. Everybody ate of the bread, drank of the juice. And it was a very meaningful time. We had put candles out, turned the lights down. Very meaningful. People were weeping. People were praying. People were repenting. Nothing I had done but just God moving. The next day I go to class. Somebody pulls me aside. and says, did you give the Lord's Supper last night down in the prayer chapel? Oh, yes, yes I did. You're not allowed to do that. You're not an ordained minister. Don't ever let us catch you doing that on this campus again. 
It happened another time, Brother Danny, we liked to go down to the river in Hendersonville and baptize. We'd go to the streets of Hendersonville, share the gospel, people would get saved, and then we'd immediately say, let's go baptize you. People would say, okay, and we'd go down to the river, and we had this little pool, and we'd go in that river, and there'd be people up on the rocks, and we'd get down there, and we'd baptize people. I baptized Michael Turner. I baptized J.D. Wilson. I baptized them all in that pool. I was a young, unordained minister. Never will forget going to class and Tanner Monday coming up to me, sitting down beside me. He said, you better stop baptizing people in that river. Well, why, Tanner? Because you've upset the professors. They sent me to tell you, don't baptize in that river anymore. There was another time. I decided I'd have a foot washing in class. <laughs> and when people come in the door, we'd wash their feet. Old Johnny Miller, who's here, he'd come in there and he sat down. I washed that man's feet. Big old feet. <laughs> I washed them. He probably wears a size 16. I washed every inch of that foot. The next day, who gave you the right to wash feet inside of a classroom? What those professors at that time failed to realize was God was moving in hearts. People were being challenged. People were being changed. But because I wasn't ordained in the ministry, I wasn't allowed to do the things that I was doing. You see, their religion, their Southern Baptist doctrine, it taught me. Without the ordination, you're not allowed to do these things. And God was moving. But their religion, their man-made religion, blocked them from becoming a part of the move of God. How I fear at Second Baptist Church that our religion, our own customs, our own doctrines would hinder us from being able to see and be a part of God moving in our midst. The story that you see before you, these Pharisees, these Sadducees, this Sanhedrin, this Jewish religious elect crowd, they were so caught up in their religions, in their customs, in their own thoughts, that they were actually trying to stop, better yet, kill the work that God was doing in their midst. Look what verse 12 through 17 says. Verse number 12. Who is this man? God's moved. Man's been healed. He's walking. Shouldn't they celebrate one? Shouldn't they celebrate a changed life? God's moving in their midst. Who is the man who told you to pick up your mat and the walk. The man who was cured, he didn't know who it was because Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. After this, Jesus found him in the temple complex and said, See, you're well. Do not sin anymore so that something worse doesn't happen to you. The man went and reported to the Jews that Jesus was the one who had made him well. Therefore, listen, is there any more heartbreaking words and all of scripture than this. Therefore, the Jews began persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus responded to them, My Father is still working, and I am working also. There's so much in this text that points us to the dangers of man-made religion blocking us from the work that God is doing in our midst. It's seen most of all, however, in that one line, and it breaks my heart every time I read it. Jesus, just imagine all that he's done. He's come to preach salvation to the lost. He's come to seek and to save that which was lost. He has come as the good shepherd to call his flock to himself. He has come to give himself the atonement for the sin of the world. He has done nothing wrong. He simply healed a man on the Sabbath day 
And by commanding to pick up that mat and walk, this Jewish religious body, instead of celebrating and embracing the work that Jesus did, the Savior of the world, the one who came to save them of their sin, instead of opening their eyes and their hearts to see the work of God in their midst, the Bible says what? They began persecuting Jesus. I wonder, I wonder what this persecution the first time we see it, were they mocking him? Were they spitting at him? Were they kicking dust at his feet? Were they slapping him as he walked by? Were they trying to stone him in the street so they could put further fear in the hearts of men who seek to do the work of God? See, we like to paint this rosy picture of Jesus' ministry that up until the point of his crucifixion, everything was okay with Jesus, that he had no problem. But friends, from this point forward, the Jews sought to destroy him, sought to kill him every opportunity they had. He was certainly no Messiah they would want, a Messiah that heals on the Sabbath day, a Messiah that declares to pick up your mat and walk on the Sabbath day. That's not the type of Messiah we want. We'll persecute him. We'll kill him. Pray, pray, pray that we wouldn't fall into the category of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and said, listen, it's the plight of every born-again Christian who tries to do the work of God. There's always somebody in their religion, always somebody in their tradition who wants to stop the work of God. Majority of times, the ones trying to hinder the work of God aren't the Muslims and the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses or the, or the homosexuals on the outside of the church. The majority of times, the biggest battle that we face, Jerry, comes from within. Amen. Just think of that text in Mark chapter 7, 8, and 9. Jesus gives his disciples authority over unclean spirits. Go and cast out demons. And then in Mark chapter 8 and Mark chapter 9, the Bible says that Jesus, he takes Peter, James, and John up the Mount of Transfiguration. And they see Jesus transfigured into his heavenly state. And Moses and Elijah come and rest with him. And Peter says what? Let's build three tabernacles and let's just stay here forever. But of course, Jesus knew there was work to be done, so they had to come back. He's given the authority to cast out demons to his disciples. And they come off of that Mount of Transfiguration. And they're nine disciples at the bottom of the mountain. And they're all trying to cast a demon out. And they can't do it. And there's a crowd around them. And there's a demon-possessed boy that's being cast into the fire, having seizures and convulsions. And Jesus commands the unclean spirit to come out, and the unclean spirit leaves. The disciples come to Jesus, and they say, why couldn't we cast it out? And Jesus says, this one comes out only by prayer and fasting. And then they begin to walk down the road. And the Bible says there in Mark chapter number 9 that the 12 disciples are having a conversation about who is the greatest. Three just went up the mountain, nine tried to cast out a demon, and they couldn't. And so now they're all wondering, who's the greatest? Who's the most? Who's the leader of this pack? And as they walk down the street, the Bible says there's a man who's casting out demons in the name of Jesus. He's not one of the twelve. He's somebody else. We don't know who he is. We don't know his name. We just know that in the name of Jesus, he's casting out demons, David. Something happened to this man where he knew that Jesus was the only one whose name had the authority over demons. And he's casting them out. Amen. These 12 disciples who were arguing amongst themselves over who's the greatest, who were hurt because they couldn't cast out a demon at the bottom of the mountain, they run to him and they tell him what? Stop casting out demons in the name of Jesus. 
And then they run back to Jesus. John runs back to Jesus and says, hey, we saw somebody casting out demons in your name. And we told him to stop because he wasn't following us. And those 12 disciples, the 12, you would think would rejoice that God is moving, that God is working, and demons are being cast out. Instead, what do they do? They block the work of God. You stop casting out demons in the name of Jesus. Just remember the words that Jesus responded with. He said, do not stop it. Because there's no one who will perform a miracle in my name who can afterwards speak evil of me. For whoever is not against us is for us, and whoever gives you a cup of cold water in my name since you belong to the Messiah, I assure you he will never lose his reward. Friends, we should be haunted by these words this morning. If this religious group would persecute Jesus, the Messiah who was in front of them in the flesh, who they saw do these things, how easy would it be for us who can't see him, see the effects of the Holy Spirit, but we can't see him in the flesh, how easy it would be for us to step in to try to block the work that God would be trying to do in our midst. I pray that we would never seek to block the work of God in our midst is one of the great dangers of man-made religion. But thirdly and lastly today, the third danger of man-made religion is this. It blinds our eyes to God's truth. Man-made religion blinds our eyes to God's truth. Listen to verse 18. This is why the Jews began trying all the more to kill him. You see how they were blinded? This is the Son of God in the flesh, the Messiah, Christ, the Savior of the world, who they were searching endlessly for. And in their religion, they're so blinded by their traditions and their customs and their man-made religion but they did not see Jesus for who he was. And the Bible says they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. You know why he made himself equal with God? Because he is God. He couldn't deny himself. In their man-made religion, they were blind to who was standing before them. In their man-made religion, they were blind to the scriptures that they studied that pointed them to Jesus. In their man-made religion, they were more concerned with what they interpreted as the law and their own writings than they were the one who had came to fulfill the law and release them from the yoke that they found themselves under. They were blind to what Jesus had come to do, all because their religion was more important to them than the truth that God had revealed in the person of Jesus before them. Reminds me of John chapter number 1, when John wrote these words. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Jesus was standing before them, the fulfillment of the law, the one in whom true Sabbath rest resided. And yet they were so consumed with fulfilling the Sabbath that they did not see that yes he was equal to God and that true peace within came from him. They had the Sabbath day all wrong and they were blind to see it. Now listen carefully to what I'm going to say to you. I'm going to cover some ground here and I want you to listen. God used the example of his resting on the seventh day of creation to establish the principle of the Sabbath day rest for his people. They were to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. They were to labor six days, and then they were to stop from all their labor, and and, and they were to rest. Not only them, their slaves, their animals, their servants, their sons, their daughters, 
Everybody was the rest. These various elements of the Sabbath symbolized the coming of the Messiah who would provide permanent rest for his people. With the establishment of the Old Testament law, the Jews were constantly laboring to make themselves acceptable to God. Their labors included trying to obey a myriad of do's and don'ts of the ceremonial law, the temple law, the civil law, etc. Of course, they could not keep all these laws, so God provided what? An array of sin offerings and sacrifices so they could come to him and for, for forgiveness to restore fellowship with him, but only temporarily. Just as they began labors after one day of rest, so too they had to continue their sacrifices. <clears throat> Each and every time they would sacrifice an animal for their sin, there was another sin that was committed and they had to sacrifice another. It's a constant burden, never ending, always there. They would rest and then they would have to labor again the next day. Hebrews 10.1 says that the law can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year make perfect those who draw near to worship. These sacrifices were offered in anticipation of the ultimate sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, the Bible says he sat down at the right hand of God. Just as God looked over his creation years before and said it was finished and rested, so Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary said it is finished. The atonement of sin was satisfied once for all. And he sat down and he rested and he ceased from his labor of atonement because there was nothing more ever to be done because of what he did. Gary, we no longer have to labor in law keeping, in Sabbath keeping, in sacrifice giving in order to be justified in the sight of God. Jesus was sent so that we might rest in God and what he has provided. But because of their man-made religion and ordinances, they were blind Amen. to the one who could give them rest. And they sought to kill him. Man-made religion blinds us from God's truth. A friend of mine in York is a pastor. About five weeks ago, one Sunday morning, Danny, he baptized 11 people. Amen. Now, you've got to understand, York's a growing community. His church is located in a growing area. People coming in and out all the time. He baptized 11 people. The church rejoiced. The church shouted. The church praised. The church worshiped. <coughs> So pastor said he was walking on cloud nine all day long, walking in the fire of the Holy Spirit. And that night when church was over, they were supposed to have a brief deacons meeting to just cover something quickly and then go home. He said he couldn't be more excited. Eleven people baptized on that day. And he went into a deacons meeting and he sat down and his chairman of deacons looked at him and said these words. I don't know, pastor if I agree with the direction that this church is going. <laughs> so blinded by his own thoughts of how things ought to be run that he was missing out on the truth of God and the myth that Jesus was working in the house. So blinded by his own religion that he's failing to see that Christianity is more than just a list of do's and don'ts. That Christianity is more than just a set of creeds and traditions put together in the hopes that some might come in the door. Christianity is more than just growing in membership by getting members from other churches who were dissatisfied with the vision of the new pastor. 
Christianity is more than sitting stiff-necked in a pew on Sunday waving a homemade fan that you made out of the bulletin while you doze off to the preacher's sermon. Christianity is more than covered dishes. It's more than a 10% tithe. Christianity is more than Sunday school. It's more than Sunday school teaching because you're the only one that's willing. Christianity is more than fancy pearls and nice suits. Christianity is more than just shaking hands and putting a fake smile on your face. Christianity is more than special music and choir specials. Christianity is so much more than our American eyes, Southern Baptist brains can ever see, think, or imagine. We must pray today that God would remove the blinders off of our religious hearts so that we might come to see, like Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, the religious zeal of that, listen, the law, religion can never save. Only Jesus can. What did Paul say? Paul said, I was circumcised the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin. He said, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Regarding the law, I was zealous, persecuting Christians. I did it, all of those things. I was the best of them all. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. And then he says, but I've counted them all the loss in view of the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ Jesus. And we would realize, wake up today and realize that our Christianity is so much more than our man-made religion, our man-made doctrines, our man-made ordinances, our man-made whatever. And that we would realize that it's all a loss in view of the surpassing knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ. Are we blind, Second Baptist? so caught up in our own religion that we are blind to the truth of Jesus as we seek to tell people it's Jesus plus this. Jesus plus this tradition. Jesus plus this custom. Friends, listen. We need not tell anyone it's Jesus plus this or Jesus plus that. No, it's Jesus plus nothing. Man-made religion is a burden. Man-made religion Religion blocks the work of God. Man-made religion blinds us to the God's tr truth. I pray this morning, Second Baptist, that we would recognize Jesus for who he is, the Savior of the world, and that we would never in our own religion put a burden on the necks of someone unnecessarily. That we would never try to block the work of God in our midst or be so blind that we couldn't see the truth of God. I pray this morning that we would look simply to Jesus and say, Jesus, we are not seeking religion. Instead, we're seeking a relationship, a relationship that honors you, a relationship that's guided by your will, a relationship that's less about me and more about you, a relationship of lordship, a relationship that's unbreakable, a relationship that's unadulterated, a relationship that seeks to lift up the name of the one in the relationship who made the relationship possible and sought you out when you weren't searching for him. If we ever get to this point, Second Baptist, where we get rid of our man-made religion and just focus on the work of God and just focus on Jesus, if we ever get to this point where we just remove the blinders and the blockages off of our hearts and focus on him, I promise, I promise, the winds of the Holy Spirit will move through this place. Amen. And he will blow the doors off the front of this building because people will come from all over the world yearning to just simply come to a place where they can freely worship him. Man-made religion is dangerous. Man-made religion is not the answer. Jesus is. We're going to have a time of invitation. And this altar is going to be open today. If you've been caught up in your own life in man-made religion, 